Well, welcome back, everybody. We are excited to have you back. And um, looks like we've got a fantastic group, both on uh, Zoom and on YouTube and uh, across a number of virtual platforms. And people are Zooming in from all over the place. So we're so pleased about that. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to have Ruth Sanderson and Jane Yolen with us today. And uh, to give you a sense of where we're going with this panel, um, Many of today's popular fairy tales first appeared in the collections published by Charles Perrault, the Brothers Grimm, and Hans Christian Andersen. The stories, however, evolved from folklore passed down for many generations. Jane Yolen and Ruth Sanderson are with us to discuss the portrayals of fairy tales and folk tales in their work, and the antagonists who manifest themselves as tricksters, evil stepmothers, and other beings with fantastical abilities and powers, and we're going to find out who their favorite characters are, which I'm excited about. Uh, Ruth and Jane are actually longtime friends. They have collaborated on many projects, and they have brought many, many stories to life, uh, both uh, those that are retold and those that they have created personally. But their collaborations include such books as Hush Little Horsey, where Have the Unicorns Gone, and The Arch of Bone, among others. And I am very pleased to introduce them now. Best known for her illustrations of classic fairy tales, such as The Twelve Dancing Princesses, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Goldilocks, uh, and many others, award-winning artist and author Ruth Sanderson's paintings have been published in more than 80 books. Her beautifully rendered artworks can also be found in books such as The Enchanted Wood, The Golden Mare, The Firebird, The Magic Ring, and The Snow Princess. In addition, Ruth is co-director of the Low Residency MFA program in children's book writing and illustrating and certificate in children's book illustration programs at Hollins University. Her recent books include the beautifully illustrated and extensively researched A Storm of Horses, the story of Rosa Bonner. And she is currently working on The Dwarf's Tale, a young adult retelling of Snow White that will be fully illustrated in Scratchboard. Her art is currently on view in our exhibition here at the museum in Enchanted. Um, and we are featuring work, a work from uh, Ruth's 12 Dancing Princesses, which we are very honored to say uh, the entire book of illustrations is in the museum's collection. Jane Yolen is a celebrated American writer of fantasy, science fiction, and children's books. She's the author or editor of more than 350 books, including The Devil's Arithmetic, a Holocaust novella, and her other works include the Nebula Award-winning Award short story, Sister Emily's Light Ship, the novelette Lost Girls, Owl Moon, The Emperor and the Kite, the Commander Toad series, and How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight? And Jane has also collaborated on projects with each of her three children. Jane's books and story of stories and poems have been recipients of many awards, including the Caldecott Medal, Nebula Awards, Christopher Medals, and World Fantasy Awards. And she has also won the World Fantasy Association's Lifetime Achievement Award the Science Fiction Writers of America Grand Master Award, and the Science Fiction Poetry Association's Grand Master Award. Six colleges and universities have given Jane honorary doctorates for her body of work. Welcome, Jane and Ruth. We are so happy to have you with us. I'm, del I'm delighted to be here. You're, 50, you're about 50 books off. I have over 400. Oh. Still. Oh my goodness, Jane. Well, we thank you for that. The, the contributions that, that you have made are, are just extraordinary. Uh, we are actually going to be running some of Ruth's images in the background as we speak. But um, I guess I'll start out with a question. And that is, um, how did you each get drawn to the subject of fantasy and folklore and fairy tales? What is it about uh, those themes that have been so meaningful and interesting to you? I was um, reading at a very young age, probably about three or four, and my 
parents had a, um, a, a, a series called the, um, something like the world, the world uh, book. And I was reading all about King Arthur because that was capital A was the first in, because it was alphabetically. And I fell in love with the Arthurian tales and that was my first entry into it. Thank you, Jane. How about you, Ruth? My grandmother was a librarian. So I grew up with books and a treasured um, book in, in my parents' house was uh, growing up was a big collection of Grimm's fairy tales that belonged to my father and was illustrated um, in black and white. And when I was able to read, I just read that book over and over. So yeah, I've always and loved fantasy in particular and fairy tales. Now, did each of you study formally, um, whether art or writing? And did you have a sense that this was an area that you would begin to explore? I knew early on I wanted to be a writer. I was writing in first grade. I was, you know, the class writer. By the time I got to Smith College, I became the class poet. Um, so I was always writing. But getting into children's books was by accident. And it's a long story I won't go into, but, but um, it was predicated upon a lie. An editor wrote to me and said, we hear you're the top writer at Smith College um, of your year. Do you have a manuscript you're working on? And I didn't, I had no manuscript at all, but I said I did. And then she invited me to come in two weeks and bring my manuscript with me. And I thought, I can't possibly write a novel or a short story in two weeks, but I could write a children's book. I thought it was easy. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> so, so yes, I, I, um... I also in first grade was was designate, designated um, the class artist. I was I was the artist, so I drew horses especially because I loved them and wanted one. So it was wish fulfillment um, <laughs> at a very young age. <laughs> and, Did you ever uh, actually get your horse? I know you have horses now, Rose. Yes, um, it took till um, I was thirteen, and my parents made a deal with me. Um, I did not want to go to to prep school. They wanted to send me to prep school and I wanted to stay with my friends in town. And so they said they would buy me a horse if I went to prep school. So oh. I did that. Yeah. Um, and I was very lucky. He was my best friend for all the years of, of high school. And I still kept him at my best friend's house. So I stayed connected with, with my friends. It was so great. If we're looking at the screen. Um an image that you did for an original story. I was wondering if you might want to say a little bit about The Enchanted Wood. It's just a beautiful book. So The Enchanted Wood was um, my second fairy tale. I retold The Twelve Dancing Princesses and it got good reviews for the writing as well as the art. And I felt like I, I, I wanted to create an original tale um, based on you know, my favorite things about fairy tales. Things happen in three, there's often three brothers. It's always the youngest one who wins the day. So the motifs of fairy tales and the woods are my favorite place. I always have been. The dark woods are, you know, often depicted in fairy tales. So I wanted to combine my love of fairy tales and my favorite things and create, um, it's almost like a personal myth, you know, and it, it has a joint hero heroine so I wanted to do that too so both boys and girl readers could identify with the characters in the story you know it, go ahead Jane thank you it, it's interesting to me that Ruth and I um, came to horses in very different ways um, she owned a horse but I got to ride Lipizzana horses and train oh. on them when I was younger um, because the Spanish Riding Academy brought uh, brought horses um, across uh, over to America. Um, so that was my my horse thing. Uh, once you've ridden a Lipizzana, you can't ride another horse <laughs> because they're so highly trained. You, you yourself become highly trained and you expect the horses, the ordinary horses to do what the Lipizzanas can't do. But, but I, I wanted to point this out. I've seen Ruth 
and sat with Ruth uh, in her studio when she's working, um, partially because my whole family um, were part of her uh, group of people who posed for her. Um, and, and when you said earlier, uh, in the earlier section, you talked about, about Rockwell um, either saying or being called, saying um, that talent and invention um, will be his salvation. Um, I wanted to add hard work because yes. sitting in the studio with Ruth, I see that she has talent. I see that she's I innovative. But what I also say, what you see in Rockwell's work and with the great artist's work is, is um, how without that hard work in the studio every day, um, nothing happens. And I think that people very often who are not in the field uh, think, oh, it's magic and it just, it just occurs. And it's not. The base of all art is that hard work. Certainly, you see that in Rockwell. Certainly, you see that in Ruth's work. They love what they're doing, but by gosh, it's hard work. That's actually a very important point, Jane. And, and you're right. Rockwell was basically in the studio seven days a week. And um, Ruth, I know that you are probably the same. Uh, I wonder, Jane, what is your work schedule like? Do you, as a writer, have a schedule set out for yourself where you are saying, you know, this is my writing time? I'm usually in, the, in, in my writing room at eight o'clock in the morning, um, maybe sometimes seven, and I go until about eight o'clock at night. Um, there's no such thing as a weekend unless someone plans it for me or, or unless I have to go and do signings or go and do storytelling or whatever. Uh, COVID has not bothered me because I'm used to being, you know, alone in the studio. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that that's how you get to 400 books. That's how you get to 300 books. That's how you get to six books, you know, is sitting there and doing the hard work, but finding what inspires you. And I think Ruth and I, Rockwell clearly too, uh, are inspired by stories, by the looks on children's faces when they're hearing stories. Mm -hmm. uh, the transformative nature of stories. And I think that that's, uh, that's what's been the sort of ground base, that and hard work. Ruth, do you want to add anything to that? I know that you are, um, as, as Jane said, an incredibly hard worker. And uh, even just from your, your postings of your recent uh, plein air paintings, um, I can't get over what you accomplish. Cannot get over it. Yes, I, I'm basically, except for travel, and when I'm in the house, um, I'm sort of working all the time. Um, one has to have a very um, agreeable um, spouse to, to put up with um, <laughs> an artist or an author, I think, who is sort of always part of, part of you is working, whether you're eating or wherever you are, you're always, the ideas are always churning. Um, and I, I have worked seven days a week for, for most of my career. And now I take weekends off and do plein air painting for fun outside. So I do art as a living and what do I do for fun? Art. <laughs> my, my children knew that if they saw me in my workroom with my fingers on, in those days, the, the um, typewriter, um, they would stand at the door and wait until I looked interruptible or they would go and get themselves you know, a peanut butter sandwich. They, they didn't need mommy to do those sorts of things. So that by the time they were teenagers, um, not only were they completely competent in many ways, um, but they all became book people. And all my children, all three of my children have had books published. That's amazing. That's wonderful. And, and Ruth, that's the case uh, with your children as well, isn't it? Yes. Um, my younger daughter, um, Whitney, has written I think it's up to 20 books now. We have collaborated on five horse stories for Random House, which she wrote, and I illustrated um, their middle grade, um, or actually their chapter books. And yeah, she's a great author. And um, my older daughter, Morgan, is also a writer and working on stories herself 
now and uh, I'm sure that eventually she will be published as well. Yes, we have a joke in our family that my children, um, each of them has over th uh, 30, 30 books published. And my daughter Heidi, um, when she's talking to groups, she says, you think I'm a big success? She said, and, um, and 30 books are, are not to, to be sniffed at. I think it's actually close to 40 now. Um, and she said, in my house, they say, aren't you, aren't you cute? <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah, there's a big, big line between 40 and 400, but 400 happened because I'm now 82. <laughs> well, and you've worked uh, pretty much every day, as you say, other than if a vacation was planned for you, I'm sure. Um, you know, an interesting question came in, and I think it is something that we wanted to touch upon a little bit in our conversation. Um, what character archetypes are you drawn to? And, um, you know, are there specific characters in fantasy or folklore or fairy tales that you like and have uh, kind of developed? My, my favorite is Baba Yaga, the great Russian witch. She loves young women and she eats the boys. <laughs> um, she's 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 this this force. Um, you can't kill her. You may bargain with her. You're not ever sure she's going to keep to her end of the bargain, but you can bargain with her. But she's just phenomenal. So I'm I also have a tendency to want to rewrite many of the stories so that the girls are not just uh, someone to be passed to the highest male bidder. Um, to just be married off to, to the strong young man who um, is not interested in them particularly. He wants to go do good deeds. Um, and, and so a lot of my stories um, that have folkloric elements in it uh, totally restructure uh, some of the old stories to do just that or to point out the fallacies and the faults in the stories. Uh, all stories have faults, but... but um, but they follow, especially folklore, follows the line of what's going on in the culture of the day. And if the culture of the day is young women to look beautiful and stay indoors and, and let the boys go off and do whatever it is they do with tilting at windmills, that's not what's going on now. So um, for me, it's finding either finding those stronger archetypes or turning some of the, of the, the archetypes that we have um, it, it, into something else. Here's an example. When I, I was teach, I taught um, children's literature at Smith College for seven years, but I also teach it uh, a lot of time. And when I talk about folk tales, I say, let's really look at some of those old stories. You know, the, the, one, the one where the prince finds the beautiful girl in the glass coffin, pays in the story, he pays money to the to the dwarfs to let him take the girl in the, the dead girl in the coffin back to his house nobody ever says what the heck does he want with a dead girl in a glass coffin we don't go there but i did and really if one of his guards hadn't stumbled and the girl turned over and the apple came out of her mouth and she sat up i can just see if you follow the logic of the story, then the prince says, take her back. I don't want her. She's alive. You know, so, so we don't talk about a lot of these undercurrents in these stories that we've accepted for years. And I think it's important for us to look at them, to take them apart, to put them together, maybe to turn them upside down. Uh, or if we're going to tell them exactly the way they've been passed down to us, then know what we're doing when we do it. Jane, did you receive any resistance when you began to ask those kinds of questions of the stories that for so many years had just been absorbed and accepted? Um, the, the kind of resist, I got a lot of, 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 oh my gosh, I hadn't thought of that kind of re response. 
but I did get a resistance from an interesting group of um, men um, who were folklorists who said that what I was writing was fake lore, not folklore, but fake lore. And it, you then have to ask, step back and ask yourself another question. Did the story just emerge full on by itself with no human intervention? Or were these stories that were told sometimes for entertainment, uh, but also at the same time for entertainment to teach the children of the day what the rules were? And they were saying, we shouldn't touch them. These are old stories. If you write anything that looks and smells and, and, and feels like a folk, folk tale, now you're doing something wicked. Wow, thank you. Ruth, how about you? Do you have certain archetypes or characters that you feel particularly drawn to? I'm loving this, this uh, gnome here. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about him. Um, probably the previous one um, was actually a strong female character. So I try, even when retelling, um, say, even the 12 Dancing Princesses, my youngest princess ends up being the heroine, but she chooses um the the gardener to marry a gardener at the end instead of the prince or one of the princes even though she's ridiculed by her sisters so you know i always do try to make the female characters in my stories um you know if it's a romantic tale like cinderella or what have you um make them make them strong and have you know have character and you know have agency and make choices for themselves and in the case of the Golden Mare, this is Yelena the Fair, who is kind of a magical character. And she she ends up very cleverly saving the day, um, you know, when when there is um, a problem with the Sultan want, wanting to marry her. <laughs> so, yeah, and in... Um, I in, want her hat. In the, in the, <laughs> um, in the Enchanted Wood, um, the... the the main character is the the wise woman's daughter, who is also very wise and and basically tempers the um, the male character and and proves and lets him know that you know the, the staying on the path is better than than taking up the sword. You know, so uh, yeah, so so I try to instill you know, strength in in my female in my female protagonists. Yes, you always do. And I, I did want to ask you just because the, the costumes here are so um, beautifully painted and ornate. Um, I made that. <laughs> wow. I made her costume. I got, it's actually a robe I got at a, at a flea market. And um, I, I, it didn't have this fancy gold, but I, I, I invented that. But I, I made her um, a, a hat as well and you know use the russian motif um you know again it wasn't quite this fancy but but i have actually have this um this costume so i do a lot of research um, those, have a lot of books on costumes those of us who pose have, have posed over the years <laughs> know that that you have to climb into the most amazing assortment of 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 costumes i remember when you were doing um Oh gosh, uh, the Secret Garden, and I was two different women in the secret, the older women in the Secret Garden, and she had these elaborate, sort of Victorian outfits for these women in heavy um, wool, and it was the middle of summer. <laughs> it's almost impossible to breathe in them. But and Jane, we have a couple of uh, <laughs> images of roots coming up where where we do have portrayals of you. So we'll look forward to uh, pointing those out for sure. Was uh, I want to ask Ruth? That wasn't Rebecca Gay, was it? Posing for that? For which one? The no, girl. no, she was. Um, she was. She posed in Cinderella as the the fairy godmother. Ah, because this looks very much like Rebecca. It does. Yeah. Uh, a question came in, and I think it's an interesting one. Um, oftentimes, stories evolve over time at each telling. Are there folk tales that uh, you are particularly fond of 
that depict that evolution? Have you found that certain stories have changed or that you have, or that you may have changed them? Well, Jane, you were just, just addressing that to some degree. I've, I've done a lot of collections uh, of, of folk and fairy tales. And when I do the research to decide which stories to go in, I very often find similar stories in, in other places and decide which stories seem the most exciting tellings um, uh, and then put them, put them in so that, that over the years I found dozens and dozens and dozens of Cinderella's and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of um, Baba Yaga type characters uh, in, it depends where, you know, where you're looking. If you look in Russia, you find Baba Yaga, but if you look in another country, you're gonna find a different version of it. Um, there are trickster stories all over the world. And sometimes there are Nancy trickster stories uh, from, from um, Africa, or they could be stories about Raven the trickster or Rabbit the trickster. So they're all, they're all very often they're very similar stories, but it's fascinating. You know, Jane, just uh, in terms of what you just said, a writer just wrote in to say that Baba Yaga is the foil to Hellboy in the Hellboy graphic novel series by Mike Mignola. So I guess characters keep um, finding new stories and being reinvented in new ways. I know that because I wrote an introduction to one of, of Mike's um, graphic novel series. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're, all, we're all related. <laughs> For sure. Um, Ruth, do you want to say a little bit about what's on the screen, maybe? Oh, yes. Um, I think at some point we were going to talk about antagonists. And, yes. and this is um, the dwarf from, from Rose Red and Snow White. And he um, he's the only antagonist in my stories that I completely made up. Um, I did not find a model for this one. <laughs> <laughs> just maybe maybe that's a good up. Thing. and actually he reminds me a little of the the Rockwell piece that you showed with the um you know the the gnome Magic or, football, or yes. whatever um yeah and so he was really fun fun to invent um the greedy dwarf I bet you know it, here's an interesting thing the rumble stillskin stories story um and this this picture reminds me of it too um, if you think about the Rumpelstiltskin story, and this is something that I found out that I, I, I've never seen it anywhere else. Here you have a character who's, who's like a greedy dwarf, right? He has a big nose, an unpronounceable name, and he is forced to live in the outskirts of town, of, a, of, the, of the community. He's not allowed in. The only thing he's allowed to do is to trade gold or, or jewels or whatever. It's the only thing he's allowed. Now, it's not a complete huge step to get from there to saying that character in folklore has consistently been consistent with, with um, uh, Jews. I'm Jewish. Those kinds of characters make me very you know, nervous uh, because those are the characters that you can tear apart um, you can throw into the fire, uh, you can kick them in the rear and get them out of town because they're not in the place where they're supposed to be. But they are almost always portrayed that way. And um, it's like giants, you know, we have giants in our head and they're a certain way. Uh, dwarfs, they stand for something else. So it's interesting how over the years, these, these characters have become codified. Um, and some people see them one way, some people see them the other. Jane, do you find that some of the roots of the characterizations come from uh, prejudices against certain groups? Do you think that is an innate aspect of some of the earlier folk tales? Certainly you have the, you know, the stupid giant. So that a stupid giant you're allowed to kill. There are certain, there are certain characters in folklore you're allowed to kill not allowed to kill a prince. You're not allowed to kill the king. You're not allowed to kill the beautiful, the beautiful girl. You're allowed to kill the wicked stepsisters who all, you know, are portrayed as nasty. Um, 
it would be interesting to spend time um, with a, a psychotherapist mm -hmm. who would look at look at these um, stories that have come down to us. Some of the stories are simply stories um, to make sure that your kids stay on the right path. Mm -hmm. uh, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to wolves in the in the woods. Uh, don't um, uh, don't open your door to strangers. They're all the sorts of things that a young, well-bred or maybe not so well-bred young woman is taught in the old days. The boys are taught, be brave, take your sword, go forward, God is with you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, that, so that this becomes a way of codifying um, in story uh, what people uh, want their children to know. So a lot of times these stories are really doing double work. They're entertainment, mm -hmm. but they are also at the same time as that they're entertainment, they are teaching you the things that you as a young man or a young woman growing up needs to know to have a good life. Yes, uh, thank you, fascinating. I was wondering if you might each describe a little bit about your creative process because you, um, you know, do tremendous research and I'm wondering how you come up with ideas and, you know, is there a sort of a, the most exciting or most interesting aspect of your process and are there stumbling blocks along the way, things that you find to be very challenging as you're developing projects? Ruth, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, so my favorite stage of, of a book is actually the planning stage. Um, that's, that's the idea stage, um, the conception, the vision of uh, the book as a whole. And I always do really small thumbnail sketches um, and, and a storyboard to, or two or three, um, sometimes I do many, uh, to, to really plan the flow of a book and how it's going to look. Um, and it's always in black and white it's always um, in full value. So I plan the darks and lights and, you know, in very small, um, very small size, um, each, each double page spread is probably, you know, one or two inches by maybe four inches. And I'm just getting the essence down of, of what I want that picture to look like. And then for the next eight months or year or two years, I have to execute my vision. <laughs> and that's actually the most difficult part is executing it and staying true to the initial vision of that. Um, and usually emotional, some kind of emotional moment um, is what I like to portray. So that, um, I guess the challenge is to try to stay true to your initial vision. And sometimes I put that storyboard right next to me when I'm, you know, when I'm working on a painting to, to try to make sure that I'm, I'm getting the same emotional impact that I felt when I was conceiving it. Speaking of emotional impact, um, this is an incredibly powerful piece. Do you, would you mind saying a little bit about this? So this is um, the 13th fairy who is the the evil one who curses um, Sleeping Beauty, uh, retold by my friend Jane here, um, lovely. And I believe um, her daughter is in the background as one of the good fairies <laughs> posing. Which one is Might she? Might be a number of good fairies. She's definitely the one um, right to the right hand side of the evil fairy. <laughs> uh, and the woman who did my costumes, Nan Hurlbert from Munson, Mass. Um, posed as the evil, the evil fairy, and a friend posed as the, uh, the queen and the child. So yes, the emotional, um, you know, sh the thrust of, of the curse is what I was trying to portray. And, and the challenge also in, in designing a picture book is where are the words going to go? You know, do you leave a space in the art that's light? Or do you you know, put it in a box at the bottom. So it's always a challenge to design, um, to design stories 
um, books. And then where's the gutter? Where's the where's that page uh, going to turn and not to put anything important in, in that space? So. You know, given that this was something that Jane uh, wrote, Jane, was, was, what was that collaboration like? Did you discuss the story before uh, Ruth began the illustrations or how did that work? Was there a lot of back and forth? <laughs> uh oh, there's a story there. Yeah. Upside down. Ruth okay. and says, um, my, um, I'm, I'm supposed to be doing a book uh, of, um, this is, um, not, not Cinderella, this is Snow. Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty. Um, and they told me they were going to write the story around my pictures and they haven't done that. And, and uh, I don't know what to do. So I told them that they should call you up and have you do it. I'm just warning you. Then, and then, they, then they called up and they wanted me to do it, but for no money. And so Ruth said, I'll give you, <laughs> I'll give you a painting or two afterwards. I said, done. And, and uh, the problem is, and, and that little orange fairy with her hand over, uh, orange girl with her hand over, her, her, her bosom is my daughter, uh, uh, who, is now, who is now up to book 40. On, um, um, and so it's easy to retell a fairy tale if you just read it enough times and get to understand where the movement is. But this one was more difficult because Ruth had painted all the paintings. And sometimes she would have a big scene, which in the book, the storytelling itself is two lines. Mm. And I had to reinvent new parts to the story to stretch it out um, in, in order to fill the space that she'd left for, for, the, for the story itself. So it was, it was a, a more difficult project than it, it would have been if we had done it the other way around, where I had written it first and then she illustrated it. Mm -hmm. but the pictures were so stunning, you know, you had to just keep going. And they truly are stunning, but I guess did that uh, mean that you were kind of filling in uh, areas that had not yet been invented, Jane? That's right. I mean, I remember I, I, I had a whole section on, on the spiders uh, that had spin their webs all over the place when the girl was sleeping. I, I think that's right, isn't it, Ruth? It was a long time ago. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember you did a wonderful job um, filling in, yeah, the, the spaces I left for text. It's like, I just estimated, you know? And yeah, sometimes you probably didn't have enough room and had to be really quick. And then other times, yes, yeah. there was a lot of space and you were um, stretched to expand that part of the story. You know, the funny thing is I look at, I look at these pictures that Ruth has done and 40 years ago, when we first met, um, I probably would have written a poem about the horse um, or the man. But these days, writing as an 82 year old, I might write a poem from the point of view of the um, of of the, the the bush and the brush here that is keeping people out. I think that as we get older, these stories take on different aspects to us and for us, and um, uh, we're never seeing them completely with the innocence uh, that we first saw when we were when we were children ourselves. And I think that's another reason why I, I feel that, you know, people choose to novelize fairy tales because there's so much essence there. And, and like Jane said, you might want to take a, the point of view of a different character. And in my case, you know, I've always loved um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, but um, I, I want to retell it from a dwarf's point of view. And the only way I can do that is to write a novel, so. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you're actually working on now, Ruth, isn't it? Yes. I've been and on it and for scratch board. A while. Uh, I know you're so proficient in as a painter, but also in that uh, scratch board medium, which I wish we had an example here. They're quite extraordinary. Would you want to say a little bit about that project? So, well, I fell in love with scratch board in particular um, when I 
wanted to illustrate The Golden Key, which was a Victorian fairy tale by George MacDonald. And then since then, I've been doing a lot of work, a lot of work in Scratchboard and it sort of took over for a while. And, and yes, I, I the, um, you know, I guess I, I never really took to the Snow White story. You know, I've never retold or illustrated it um, as a picture book, um, but I have read other versions, um, novelized versions, and, and I just got an idea that perhaps it was a dwarf that made the magic mirror for the queen. And what, you know, what would be the consequences of that when he discovered um, what she was going to do with it and what she did with it because he becomes friends with the Snow White character. So it's been, um, it's been a long time in the making. I kind of work on it um, here and there, but I'm determined to finish it uh, by the end of this year. It's very close. So, but then, but then I have to illustrate it. <laughs> right. Um, it might did, be another few years. So. I did a Snow White um, novel. Um, and, and yes, I love it. At it's the problem with novelizing is you can't, you can't just sit with that small, small little, um, um, uh, very tight story anymore. You have to, you have to embrace it and you have to enlarge it, which means you're, you're finding new characters that haven't been in, in, uh, um, the books before or who haven't started them before and and it it uh, it has all of the problems that a novel has just a plain everyday novel but you're but you've got these characters who have always been sort of um uh, stand-ins for other things for other for for this one is the good guy this one is the bad guy kind of thing and 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 it takes a lot of work to do that kind of a novel and then Ruth, that you're going to illustrate it as well, <laughs> it gives me heart attack. <laughs> it might be my final project. It might take me another forever till the end of time. <laughs> I doubt it, Ruth. You're just gonna have to go off on another painting excursion to take a break once, after that. Once I finish the text, um, the, the pictures will grab me. I just really need to finish the story first. It's funny because in picture books, I often will work both ways. And I've done a few sketches for this, but I, I really need to do um, to finish the story first. And, and yes, as Jane said, you know, the archetypal, you know, evil stepmother, I, she, you know, I can't make her a cardboard character, I, I've got to give her depth and a reason why she wants to kill, you know, her, uh, you know, her stepdaughter. So it gets dark, it, you know, it, it has turned into a, a young adult story, mm -hmm. not, not a middle grade mm -hmm. story, so it's dark. You know, there's a question from the audience, which is um, very interesting. How do you relate to a younger generation? And do you have to think differently about your stories based upon, you know, maybe when they're created and who they're created for? Or, or are you, really just creating your story first and then it finds its own audience. I talk to my grandchildren. I mean, I, I, I have six grandchildren and they each have a variety of interesting and some of them outrageously outspoken ideas about what I should be doing. Nana, you can't do that anymore. Nana, you can't say that anymore. What would be an example of something they said you could not say or maybe write about? Well, I think just making someone evil without, without why, or, or making, making a girl ugly and that makes her bad, that sort of thing. Um, but also they're giving me all the time stories of themselves um, and what they're doing. I have, I have grandchildren who are, um, I have one grandson and the rest are granddaughters, but the grandson is, is the most um, sort of outrageously wonderful of the group. And 
I have one granddaughter who is, um, is um, uh, her pronouns are um, we, us, they, you know, so I'm learning all of these things that I might not have otherwise learned um, because I love my grandchildren and they are also wonderful and interesting and, and uh, will tell me if they don't like what they see in my writing. And in fact, I've written books with two of them now. And each time I'm very careful to listen exactly to their critiques because if you're writing with someone else, you listen to them very carefully. And they are right there in the now where yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah, it's very exciting to actually work with them on projects. Mm -hmm. Ruth, how about you? Do you have that sense of the audience you're speaking to particularly, or do you shift your point of view based upon that? No. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm writing and illustrating what I love, and I, I guess I just hope that other people um, uh, react react to it. Uh, I guess in the in the case of fairy tales, I'm trying to do, you know, sort of a timeless a timeless look um, and yeah, I hope that, hope that it appeals. Um, my, my, now that you're showing this piece, um, over the years, uh, young women have contacted me saying, you know, they read the 12 princesses as, you know, when they were growing up and the images just stayed in their mind and now they're getting married <laughs> and they are actually designing the, the wardrobes of their, their wedding party um, based on, on my costumes for, wow. from, from the 12 Dancing Princesses. Um, in fact, what, there was one woman who wanted me, wanted to fly me to down to Florida to do a painting of herself in one of the dresses and her husband. And at the time I was just too booked up and I, I, I could not do it. So, wow. so that, that, that has happened um, many times that, that the images, even though they're 15th century costumes, you know, I've just appealed to the imagination of, of, um, of young, young girls and women and st st stick with them, they stick with them. And you did design and sew these costumes. Oh, no, 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 no. I did, no. The, I did uh, the Snow Princess, but I, I worked with a costumer um, from Munson yes. who was a professional costumer and she she did costumes for the local summer theater so uh, many of the most of these costumes um, we just borrowed from the wardrobe that that they had um, and she made she did make the youngest princess costume and she was so knowledgeable um, in fact I, I often over the years conferred with her on on uh, costume design she created all the hats which you know they're not all the the princess cone hat you know, in the 15th century, they, they had all these different types of hats. So that's why the princesses are not generic. They, they are, you know, all individuals. I want to have, well, I could no longer wear it, but I want to have the, the costume that's the turquoise one on the left. That, that the what? The turquoise costume on the left of the pictures. Oh. Yes, that's beautiful. With the drop, the that drop. would look great on you, Jane. <laughs> um, um, I'd love to ask uh, what you both feel are the most important factors in creating a great painting or narrative. Are there particular things that a story or illustrated story should have um, to have impact? Gorgeous language, truth, and a forward motion. Mm -hmm. I think um, in, in, in many pictures or, or scenes, um, it's important to have an emotional, to, to portray an emotional moment connection. I mean, not in every scene, but um, to always have that, um, that element so that the reader can, uh, can empathize and put themselves into into the story and 
you know, I use color to create mood, you know, that's, I feel that's important too. So each of my pictures has a, has a color scheme that I create. I often just work from black and white reference photos and create my own, my own colors and, you know, color, color creates mood. And in, um, it's interesting, you were talking about um, Rockwell's uh, idea that pathos plus a little humor sticks. And that really struck me. And I realized that in many of my retellings, I, I actually have added a little twist of humor at the end that feels right for the story. It's maybe a little bit of a modern sensibility that I've added to some of the stories and just change the ending a little. Um, and yeah, that, that, that little addition of humor um, when there's a serious <laughs> subject is important. Speaking of humor. <laughs> Speaking of humor. Can anybody guess why Jane is laughing? So, yes, the wise woman, also one of my favorite archetypal characters. Um, and Jane is the archetypal wise woman <laughs> in real life as well as as a model. <laughs> Ruth, how did you re recruit Jane to uh, become your model for this character? Oh gosh, Jane loves to model. She just, I think she's modeled for every artist that she, <laughs> if they're close, <laughs> she loves to model. Um, it doesn't. It's, it's the clothes, Ruth. <laughs> <It's> the clothes. <laughs> so Ruth Rockwell would um, give very particular directions. He, he, he once said that if he hadn't been an illustrator, he would have been a movie director. So he would give each model very, very specific directions on how to pose, how to express, you know, create expression. Is that something that you do as well? Absolutely. In fact, I, you know, those little <laughs> uh, thumbnail illustrations I was talking about, you know, I take them you know, when I do a photo shoot, you know, if there's a number of different models, um, I'll take those little sketches that, you know, I just make out of my head and, and then I position the people, um, you know, in, in the scene, you know, based on, um, based on my little sketches and then tell them what's going on and try to get them to, um, to emote a little emotionally in the photo. Um, it's a little easier with adults to do that. Sometimes, you know, if it's a young child, um, it can be a little, a little tricky, but for, for the most part, um, you know, I, I use um, children, I think maybe Rose Red and Snow White or Goldilocks might have been the youngest children I used, but but they were all very accommodating and tried <laughs> tried to get into the scene. It is like directing a movie, you know, mm -hmm. still shots. It's like, you know, you're choosing fifteen still scenes from a movie, and you want that, you do want that emotional moment. My my granddaughter uh, Madison. Um, who is I've done two books with and is now in law school. She did a lot of modeling for for you, mm -hmm. and uh, she loved it. She loved doing it. I think that this picture for me, it's the connection between the two, one sleeping and one not, but you feel that they have made a connection somehow. And I think it's I think it's between it's what's going on between them not not uh, anything else. It's almost as if he knows she's there, but he's not speaking yet. He's not talking, mm -hmm. he's looking and saying, <coughs> maybe I should just hit him with the stick. <laughs> <laughs> Looks yeah. like that's about to happen, actually. Uh, we have a nice comment from Alice Carter, who spoke last night. Um, Thanks, Jane, for the great advice, gorgeous language, truth, and forward motion. So greatly encapsulated. Um, I'm wondering, while you are working, do you ask for advice or comment um, on a piece as your story progresses, or is that something that you would prefer not to? And I, 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 I sort of interrupt my question. Is this Jane also up in the upper right, right hand corner, Ruth? As mother, yeah, this is Jane behind me as well. That's the original painting. Yes. Back, back there. I thought it would. It yep. happened to be in my. In my cabinet so it's I really wonderful it out. <laughs> that is oh. jane and that's my magical mother goose you know i had to add fairies and elves to my mother goose of course <laughs> <laughs> well, of course it's a beautiful painting the elves are keeping house for for mother goose 
He had me sitting on um, on a the arm of a of a uh, an easy chair um, so that she could spread my my the back. It looked so it would look like it, we were flying. Oh, that's fun. Okay. Did you have the costume on? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the costume isn't always exact. It sort of simulates, and then yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll um, alter it a little bit. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so actually, do you ask for advice or comment, or do you prefer to get through a project and then, you know, kind of put it out there? Hmm. Uh, both, both ways. Both ways. I have um, a writing group that I am... Um, uh, I'm in contact with every uh, once a week uh, on our good days once a week during COVID we were zooming a lot um, all with women who are professional children's book writers um, but my daughter lives next door and I can always ask her to read something if if I'm a little weary or wary about it um, and she she pulls no punches she just tells me <laughs> but I'm the same with her. She asked me to read her stuff too. That's great. How about you, Ruth? Do you tend to like to move through something before checking in with people? Well, in terms of writing, I, I certainly share that. Um, and the novel, of course, you know, I'm I'm showing a lot of people and getting a lot of different advice um, because that's that's new for me. Um, but of course you work, um, when you're doing a book, you work with an editor who gives you feedback and also, you know, an art director who, who often gives you feedback. So, um, but then once they approve, um, you know, sketches, uh, then in terms of paintings, um, I usually don't ask advice in the middle of a painting. No, I, I pretty, have a pretty strong vision in illustration where I want to go and then it's just, um, great, great guns <laughs> going ahead yeah. to execute, to execute it. Yeah. Do we have a question from, um, I'm sorry, Jane, did you want to pipe in there a little bit? Ruth has a long history of being one of the fastest painters I know. Um, she used to be able to yes. push out um, these gorgeous Renaissance looking paintings uh, in two or three days. I think she slowed down a little bit to maybe a week. Mm -hmm. and um, but it's, it's always been, we're in the same, I, I helped start a group of, um, called Western Massachusetts Illustrators Guild and where they show their stuff. And she always seems to have a new painting to show, uh, or paintings to show. Yes. Um, it's, so. it's those, it's those seven days a week. And yeah, this one probably took me, uh, three weeks, Jane. <laughs> Well, so they're not all fast. It depends on the complexity of, of the scene. Uh, the, my recent biography of Rosa Bonheur, um, I have an 80 hour painting. It's, um, yeah, and that's over a number of weeks, not, not just two. Um, yeah, because I, I often work on multiple things at once. So it's hard to judge exactly yeah. um, how many hours, but um, I did log my hours for this, that particular project. And sometimes it'll take me 20 hours just to compose, to compose a picture before I even start painting. So um, it, again, it depends on complexity. Mm -hmm. And yes, occasionally I have done paintings in three days. <laughs> we have a question from the audience, actually from uh, our director, Lori Norton Moffat, uh, who writes that beloved illustrator, Jerry Pinkney, who many of you may know, ha uh, actually passed away very unexpectedly this week uh, and who will be so greatly missed. Um, retold many classic tales, casting characters as persons of color to make them more accessible to young children of color. Have either of you rewritten classic tales and illustrated them to decenter whiteness and make them more accessible to children and parents of color or maybe created uh, other unique stories um, for that purpose? Um, I think both of us um, have, I, my, um, my stories, of course, I don't illustrate. So, um, but I have in the various books over the years, uh, when I did collections, I always was very careful to try to have stuff from everywhere, uh, people of color, people, but, but it's a little, um, these days, a little, uh, you have to be careful because own voices means that if you're not that 
person, um, you have to be extraordinarily careful or knowledgeable to use um, someone else's story in, in your story. So um, that's, that's right now we're in that tipping point. Uh, but if you look at my, my collections, especially, there are stories from Africa, from India, from um, the southern borders, um, from China, from Japan, from Korea, um, in indigenous people's stories from all over the world. Uh, but in that case, very often I will not retell them. I will, I will tell them as, I will present them as told from within the, from within the culture. Yes, thank you, Jane. But those are important points. Um, Ruth, any thoughts about that? Sure. Um, I mean, in general, my fairy tales have been, you know, Western um, fairy tales. So I'm I'm sticking with the tradition of, you know, of the um, the ethnic group that the fairy tales are originally told in. Mm -hmm. um, my my recent um, the book I just finished, which will be out in March, the biography of Rosa Bonheur. I did a lot of research on, you know, who would be, who else would be, might be in the pictures in the background. She obviously was French. So, I, you know, I'm depicting her as close as possible to, to how she looked, but there are horse handlers um, that are black um, and a, a, a lot of African um, presence in, in the backgrounds of, of the illustrations and street scenes, museum, what have you. So, um, because there was a, a big presence in, in Paris at that time. Um, so I wanted to, to show that. I even put um, Dumas, the, the author who, who has Haitian descent, he wrote The Three Musketeers. He's actually in the final picture looking at her painting of the horse fair because he was there in 1850. Um, he was in Paris. And so I thought, well, he probably went to that that exhibit where the horse fair was shown. So, so I have him sitting on a couch in the background. I have to say that those originals are just absolutely amazing. Ruth um, was kind enough to bring them to the museum to show us uh, when she was here during uh, the summer or sculpture competition and the research and the detail are just amazing. When does that book come out, Ruth? It should be out in March. Um, However, the boat situation I know um, is, is a little problematic right now and I don't know how it will be next year. I do know a few people that um, were supposed to have book launches and the books didn't come in. So um, hopefully by March and that is the 200th anniversary of Rosa Bonner's uh, birth. So that's when we wanted um, the book about her life to come out and about her painting of horses <laughs> here. That will be painted, um, the horse fair, which is the largest painting of horses you will ever see. <laughs> it's been hanging at the Metropolitan Museum of Art since the late 1800s mm -hmm. and it's eight by 16 and a half feet wide. And I wanted to know how did a woman in 1850 do this? <laughs> so that's what my story is about, basically. Yeah, it's uh, quite remarkable. Well, I have two examples up on the screen of uh, books that you have both collaborated on. I, I'm just wondering if you might tell us a little bit about these and maybe where the ideas came from and how you decided to work together. Um, both of them were very different. Uh, I wrote, Where Have the Unicorns Gone? And then we asked Ruth to do it. She wanted to do um, a lullaby book uh, of horses. Um, and I think it was going to be a board book, Ruth. Is that true? Is that true? Am I remembering that right? Hmm. Uh, no, they, they turned it into a board book, but um, no, I, I think it was originally um, a picture book. Picture book. Mm -hmm. And and so um, Ruth and I discussed that one, um, and and then I wrote it in rhyme. I guess they're both written. They're both in rhyme. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, Where Have the Unicorns Gone, gone came to Ruth fully fledged, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Jane, what, what is it about unicorns? That, do, do you have a particular love of that type of, of character? Oh, absolutely. You know, they're horses on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and only girls can tame them. So, you know, I mean, 
Come on, that's a gimme. Ruth, wow, uh, there's a beautiful series in, that you've, um, we're gonna be passing through from that book. Would you wanna say a little bit about these? So uh, I tried to do something a, a bit different with this book. Um, it's so evocative and, you know, you know, unicorns are magical. They're, they're kind of almost your archetypal. So I, um, I did a really a different technique where I, I made a texture with a palette knife on the surface that I was working on. And then I kind of glazed over it. So in the corner here, you can sort of see in, in the waves, there's sort of, it's very textural. So I, I, I played with, with that a lot and um, and this actually was the original cover, and what you saw was um, was the paperback cover. This was um, the wraparound of the original hardcover cover, so it was more symbolic and evocative. It's absolutely beautiful, and I think we have another coming up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love Jane's poem. How you know it's like taking unicorns through time, and and each time um, you know they go down to a body of water and they go down to the pool, the hidden pool, or I, I can't remember, um, I should have the book so I can read the lines because they were just so beautiful. So I wanted to, to, to have my paintings um, as evocative as possible to mirror Jane's um, wonderful evocative text. The last page one more. has a picture uh, of there, yeah. Of the, I, I happen to own this painting and I love it. Oh and boy, it's amazing. If you, if you look carefully, you can see the unicorns within the water. Right. And you can also see that, um, you know, a little bit that palette knife texture is still there, is, is underneath the, um, the painting. But the translucency her. of those, of the water, um, just amazing, beautifully done. Thank you. I was just at the beach in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and I was mesmerized. Um, th there was a, a place at, on the cliff walk where um, yesterday morning, it was just so windy and the waves were just exploding. And I hadn't been to a place like that on, on the shore for many, many, many years. And, and it reminded me of, of my, this painting of the unicorns. And, and now I just want to paint ocean pictures <laughs> and put unicorns <laughs> in them again. So you might see those um, coming up. We'll see okay. if I have I would look forward to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I guess maybe a, a, a last question uh, to ask you is, you know, what, what motivates your work and what aspect of your work have you found most rewarding or, or is there a project that you are particularly proud of? The next one. <laughs> the next one. That's what Rockwell used to say. Yes. I, I once I have finished with something, I mean, I'll still read it at at, at, at at visits with schools or whatever. But I'm on to the next. I'm always, and I write a poem a day that I send out to over a thousand subscribers, mm -hmm. and many of them are fantasy poems. Um, and it's it's just what's going to happen today? What is the new thing today? I think if I weren't interested in that next thing, that new thing, mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be still writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That keeps you moving forward. As you said in your, in your earlier statement, Ruth, how about you? Actually, that, I think, I think almost the same. I, I am, I am looking forward. We are, we are driving our own lives. Um, and, you know our own personal myths and our you know what what we want to accomplish and and we are moving forward and looking forward um and and that way um yeah that's that's the motivation is is kind of what what's next what's the next um what's the next idea what's the next vision what you know what do i want to what else do i want to say um in art or in writing um but I, I, I have to say, um, you know, you're showing Arch of Bone here. This was such an, an incredible um, opportunity to illustrate Jane's book, which is coming out in just a few weeks, Jane, is that correct? I, I think it's coming out in, in November. 
Um, and again, I hope it makes it on the boat here before Christmas. Um, but, um, you know, Jane retold, well, not retold, but sort of a con continuation of, of the story of Moby Dick. And it, it, it just a, um, a wonderful fantasy, um, fantasy story for middle grade readers. And um, I illustrated in Scratchboard, it's really only my second book that um, for, for children that I've illustrated in Scratchboard. So I'm really excited by... Um, um, they I'm, are you know, stunning pictures, stunning. Mm -hmm. And but Jane now has three of the pictures. <laughs> that's um, exciting. I'm also a collector. Um, th the book starts with a young boy, a young man. Um, uh, the, it's 1864. There's a knock on the door. It's early morning. He lives on Nantucket. Nobody comes to the door at, you know, at, at that time. His mother's been sick for much of the year and his father's off on a whaling voyage that is long overdue. And he opens the door and he sees a man he's never seen before. And he says, who are you? And the man says, call me Ishmael. Mm -hmm. And we're in Moby Dick territory. Mm -hmm. His father was the, um, was Starbuck, who was the, um, the second in command, who did not have enough wherewithal to tell the, tell the sailors that he was taking over this ship uh, because because the um, uh, the captain had gone bonkers and was going to kill them all, which he did. Um, and so the boy then runs off with his dog into the in a in a boat into a storm and and um, is marooned on an island. So we're we're to we go from Moby Dick to Robinson Crusoe in about six chapters. Wow, it's wonderful, just wonderful. But they wanted to do, they wanted to have some pictures in it and they showed me um, some ideas that, that they had and they were kind of, yeah. I said, you need to look at Ruth Sanderson's work. Mm -hmm. She's a scratch board now and the scratch board will bring you right back to that period, right back to that time yes. and, and, and will pop because scratch board pops in a way that, that uh, just black and whites don't. And they took one look at her work and they went, oh my God, we want her. And she worked incredibly fast to get it in time. Yes. COVID shut everything down. <laughs> I'm supposed to be giving um, uh, a reading, uh, an in-person reading at the, the um, Mystic, um, um, Mystic Connecticut- um, um, Mystic uh, Seaport Museum. The, the Seaport Museum. Yeah on November 6th, and we don't know if the, the book's gonna be here. Oh, so frustrating. Oh, oh, oh. Well, I think you gotta do it anyway, right? <laughs> but I, I love the, the Neil Gaiman uh, quote here. Jane Yolen is a phenomenon, a poet and a myth maker who understands how old stories can tell us new things. And I think you have uh, both done that for so many people. And it has actually been just such an honor and a pleasure to speak with you today. And I thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know everybody online enjoyed it. We have so many uh, laudatory comments and um, we can't thank you enough for being here today, but also for your body of work, which has uh, just brought so many important stories to light. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Stephanie. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So uh, thank you everyone for being with us. We are going to take a short break. And then at 12 p.m. in about 15 minutes, uh, or maybe a couple more than 15, but um, 12, 15, so at 12 p.m., we will be back here with uh, Victor Nye, Justin Gerard, and Ian McCaig. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.